thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, very daunting. I realize that nothing I can say tonight will be nearly as entertaining as Mayor Giuliani. Uh, I'm honored to join you. I know that I follow many more distinguished speakers, but I, I did receive this note today from my doctor. What a, why are you? To whom it may concern, Scott is the healthiest person to ever deliver. The Herb Lock Lecture. Uh, my family is here. Um, I won't, I won't embarrass them anymore. Our daughter Elise is joined by her friend Adelaide Machado Ohm. Uh, Adelaide has just started on their school newspaper. Uh, Elise is on the yearbook, so that's the first draft of history and history. Um, <laughs> Elise and Addie will be glad to review your resumes at the end of the evening. Uh, and of course, we're here because of the vital work of the Herb Lock Foundation, which Herb secured with his bequest of tens of millions of dollars that he earned during his career as a cartoonist. Uh, so Elise and Addie, I, I would pick up the pencil as soon as you can. <laughs> Forget this word stuff, start drawing. Uh, word, is that, is that kind of standard for cartoonists? Tens of millions of dollars, yeah. Hmm. Uh, I'm honored to share the stage with Ward Sutton, his cartoons uh, in the Globe and those under the moniker of Stan Kelly in The Onion. Uh, reveal a great stylist and satirist who certainly merits comparison with the man whose name is on the award that he takes home tonight. Uh, and let me just add, I speak for myself tonight. I do not speak for my employer. Uh, I don't even speak for my family, uh, perhaps especially my family. <laughs> but I believe nothing I say will mean that I can't be a fair reporter because one of the differences between covering the news and blogs and tweets and doing it for a living is professionalism. We have personal beliefs, though it's been my experience, there's nothing like journalism to shake up your personal beliefs or the ones you thought you had, but I believe we can do our jobs fairly um, and report fairly. Uh, I wrote a letter to Herb Block when I was in high school. We would see Herb's drawings two or three days later, but still timely uh, and pertinent, rerun on the Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, during these days, he was lampooning Richard Nixon and lamenting the loss of Dr. King, uh, and he certainly put his pen and his ink pot into the argument for civil rights. Herb, along with Clayton Moore, who was the Lone Ranger, and Bill Friedkin, the director, Shecky Green, the comedian, were the most notable graduates of my alma mater, Nicholas Senn High School in Chicago. Uh, although locally, Herb and the rest of us fall behind a score of beloved organized crime figures. <laughs> Uh, I shamelessly played on the Sun Connection and probably Herb wrote back. Uh, I was then putting out what we called an underground newspaper in high school and I wrote back to Herb to thank him for his thank you note uh, and to ask him Senite to Senite for an interview. Uh, astoundingly, he agreed and sent me a phone number. Now, now, my memory of that interview is anecdotal. I know it was short because long distance cost money in those days. Uh, and I kept looking at the second hand in our kitchen clock as Herb ruminated. Um, <laughs> but I asked him about one of his most famous cartoons uh, from 1968, that eventful year, 50 years ago. He had famously for years drawn Richard Nixon with the swarthy, almost piratical beard. And that lugubrious growth became an artistic emblem for uh, Nixonian uh, duplicity and thuggery, especially during the McCarthy era. But Herb told me that he had heard that Richard Nixon would snatch the post from their front stoop each morning when he'd been vice president to hide the newspaper from his daughters so they wouldn't see their father depicted as a shady character. Uh, say what you will of Richard Nixon, he was not a shady father. Herb was unbowed as an artist and a commentator, but he was touched as a human being. And he thought that he'd made his point time and time again. Herb Block was pointed and professional, but he wasn't petty. He understood that politicians had their job and so did he. And so when Richard Nixon was elected president in 1968, Herb famously drew his own drawing board, brushes and ink pot below a sign that said, this shop gives every new president of the United States a free shave. 
And Herb told me that although he'd been in the nation's capital by then for decades, uh, he still thought of himself as a guy from the north side of Chicago and tried to view people as people, not just political positions. And I try to remind myself of that too. Another cartoon from 1968 I actually discovered just a few years ago. Herb showed a man knocking on the door of a comfortable home. You look a little more closely and you see that this man looks like Uncle Sam, but he's painfully skinny. And he's got a report in his hand issued by a presidential commission on hunger in America. The man inside that home sits in an easy chair and tells him, you must have the wrong address. This is a very prosperous country. The art and audacity of her block to use the reflection of an American symbol to shake the conscience of the American people. I got to interview her when I became an actual reporter in the 1990s and he talked about the fact that he'd left school to begin drawing cartoons at the Chicago Daily News in 1929. Now this is the very year that Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur of the Daily News debuted their classic play, The Front Page. Now, I suspect this was a play many of us have loved, but you've really got to be selective in your affection for it today. Um, it portrayed a news business that was bustling, creative, roused about, and fun, and absolutely not inclusive, uh, often casually bigoted, despicably sensationalist, and routinely boorish. But those undereducated, maladjusted, overbearing, and often debauched news people help create a vital, competitive, and populist news industry. This was something new and distinct in, American, in America. Journalists who weren't the voice of and didn't work for any political party or movement. They reported for a living. The great daily news columnist of that era, Finley Peter Dunn, coined what became known as a motto for Chicago and perhaps American journalism, that the job of journalism is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Um, and by the way, we do say job, because those of us who are blessed to do this as our life's work also have to know that to make it work, we have to make it pay enough to keep going. I've always felt a little awkward um, at award ceremonies when American journalists salute each other for courageous reporting. Um, that happens, but however ugly, um, these times in which we're living. We're still blessed to live and work in a place in this country in which we are free to do this work and more likely to be honored for it than arrested, jailed, or defenestrated. Um, Russian journalists, including, and I want to mark some names, Nikolai Andrushenko, Dmitry Popkov, uh, Andrei Ruskov, and Maxim Borodin, who all died just within the last year under mysterious circumstances, they had courage. They investigated government corruption in a society that pushes reporters out of windows, doesn't give them awards. Mexican journalists, including Carlos Rodriguez, Guamaro Aguilando, Edgar Castro, Candido Vasquez, Rosario Flores, Luciano Rivera, Edwin Paz, Salvador Pardo, Hector Cordoba, this is a long list, isn't it, of Mexican journalists who were killed just in the last year while investigating crime and corruption. They had courage. We could also recall other local journalists who've died in Myanmar and the Philippines or been jailed in China, Cuba, and Iran. Um, I have covered many conflicts overseas and felt in danger a few times, usually by my own miscalculation. But I knew when I was in Bosnia or the Middle East, I'd be safe if I got home. A lot of our colleagues in other societies are not safe, especially in their homes. That's where they've been pushed out of windows and slaughtered in hallways. We should hold them in our thoughts and our hearts and our gratitude each and every day. One of the truisms you can hear about these times is that we've never seen anything like this current administration and its disdain for the press. I want to be careful about that. Uh, Northern newspapers savaged Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War as a baboon, a gorilla, and a butcher. And Mr. Lincoln, who sits so nobly in marble just a few blocks from here, closed down more than 300 newspapers. He considered them to be subversive. 
I don't fear today's US government can shut down the free press. But for the first time since I became a working reporter, I am shaken by the sheer brute ugliness with which members of this administration, including the president, disparage, mock, and demean human beings and make special targets of immigrants, ethnic and religious groups, whole countries, and yes, the press. This kind of speech is just un-American, and I don't have a stronger profanity than that. <laughs> I'm aghast that this administration so often uses the access they have to speak directly to the American people to distort, to twist, deceive, and outright lie to the American people. This isn't just a politician who strives to put a positive spin on discouraging facts. It's one of the most powerful public officials in the world who consciously peddles whoppers like worthless swampland or muddy lots in a David Mamet play to the American people. The scale of these fictions would daunt Charles Dickens. Placido Domingo wouldn't have the breath control to sing them all. <laughs> I made just a modest list. The President of the United States slurred the father of Ted Cruz by suggesting he had a role in the Kennedy assassination. He boasted of having the largest inauguration crowd ever when it wasn't even a quarter of the size of the World Series parade for the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> yeah. You know I'd work that in there. He continued to claim massive fictitious vote fraud and a landslide in the Electoral College when it was only the 46th largest margin. That puts him only slightly ahead of Zachary Taylor. He insists the murder rate in America is the highest it's been in 47 years. It's actually the lowest in 60 years, although, to be sure, it's still too high, especially in Chicago. The president apparently dictated his own fantasy of a medical report. His health has evidently improved dramatically in the decades since he had such vicious bone spurs. And then the president told reporters straight to their faces he didn't know of any payoff to an adult film star for her silence. What's the word for that kind of brazen falsehood? A fantasy, a misstatement, a lie? What would you tell your children? The president also said the public approval rating of the press is lower than it is for Congress. That's not true, but alas, it's close. Our role in response to these fictions is obvious and impossible to shirk. We report the truth without fear or favor. And we don't do this to contradict the President of the United States, although this is democracy and that's fine. We do it to do our jobs. I don't want to be melodramatic about this current atmosphere and administration. There are, I think, lots of editors and news executives here tonight. I know, we reporters can be annoying as hell, can't we? Editors here, don't tell me you haven't looked at a troublesome reporter, then looked over at a window and thought, hmm. <laughs> this isn't Russia or China where good reporters live under threat and assault and don't have evenings like this in the Library of Congress. The president that taunts and insults a free press has condoned mob violence and used his power to reach Americans directly to promote one whopper after another, spreads fuel on a fire that scorches democracy. Just today, the president suggested maybe he'd have to lift the credentials or should lift the credentials of, of reporters. I find that more naive than sinister. You don't need any credentials to be a reporter. <laughs> I, I, that's why we're in this business. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be a licensed massage therapist. <laughs> so I became a reporter. Um, in a way, I'd actually like to thank the current administration for giving us a chance to prove our value all over again. Uh, I think for the first time in our lives, our daughters might believe I do something for a living that is vaguely significant. Um, we've been reminded as professional politicians know that reporters have their own professional responsibilities. 
The reporter's gallery yonder, said Edmund Burke, a fourth estate. And those responsibilities are as old as those of elected officials. But I see another threat to the job of a free press that cannot be blamed in this administration. And that's the echo chambers that we have engineered for ourselves. People can now choose any news they want. They don't have to be disturbed with a story, a fact, or opinions that chance to upset their view of the world. People who believe the moon landing was a hoax can find videos to support that preposterous view. People who believe the attacks of September 11th were a fraud, perpetrated by Choose Your Poison, the CIA, the Bush administration, Mossad, the House of Al-Saud, or the International Jewish Conspiracy, can find support for this slander and think of themselves as a community instead of lunatics. People who chant blood and soil, an old Nazi slogan on the soil of the United States of America, which has been nourished by the blood and the lives of people from all over the world, can form their own e-world sealed off from real humanity. Incels, as they call themselves in online forums, can tell themselves they're aggrieved victims, not loveless losers. Millions of good and conscientious Americans now fill themselves with news they choose that only nourishes the views they already hold. In a way, it's a return to the time when political movements and parties sponsored newspapers. People sometimes uh, congratulate public figures, commentators, or comedians for speaking truth to power, but the fact is more and more Americans from all political corners are happy just to speak to themselves over and over, tweet after tweet, post after post. And people that talk to themselves, whether it's mumbling to yourself on the subway or echoing only people who agree with you online need help. <laughs> We're using the power of the internet to connect us to the world, then close us off from different points of view. Too often we use this dazzling information technology not to inform ourselves, but just to confirm whatever we'd like to believe. Every day I get emails saying, I don't listen to NPR to hear, dot, dot, dot. And then they finish that sentence with a point of view, a person or a group of people or an area of interest they seem convinced will make them contract a fatal rash if they so much as hear of it. And it depresses me that after so many decades where good journalists have strived to bring a variety of opinions and experiences to people, so many Americans now choose to close their ears, their hearts, and their minds. In these times, that command we take from our founding days to afflict the comfortable also means challenging the comfortable notions and nostrums of our audiences and any ideas they might have about the world left, right, and center. Real journalism doesn't just pat your audience on the head to say, you're right. You're smarter than everybody else. Everything you think is right, and we're going to help you keep thinking that way. It's having the nerve and the respect and the professionalism to tell an audience, this story may shake up your views, and that's what we're here to do. And now and then we should remind our audiences, there is no safe space in journalism. We should advise our listeners, our viewers, and readers, in this space you will encounter words that rile and even offend you, views that appall and depress you, facts that defy your own views, reporting that upsets and distresses you. That's why we're here. When we hear cliches, normalize, marginalize, the so-and-so community, empower, synergize, we should strike them out and speak with clarity. And when the powerful bully and slur, we should strike back with civility and correct them. Back to the front page. When the play opens, Hildy Johnson, our crime reporter, is tired of his scruffy reporter's life. He comes into the criminal court press room to tell his friends he's leaving, he's getting married, go off to New York, he'll work as an ad man for the company owned by his fiance's father. And Hildy exclaims, I love this speech, he says, journalists, beeping through keyholes, running after fire engines like a lot of dogs, waking up in the middle of the night to ask for pictures of their dead loved ones or what they think of Mussolini, a lot of Daffy Badinskis running around with holes in their pants, and for what? 
so a million office workers and motormen and their wives can think they know what's going on? That sounds like a good life to me. <laughs> when presidents, politicians, or other sources of power attack us, I don't think we should profess to be offended or aggrieved. Remember, this is the life we chose. The president may seem more open and abusive in his contempt, but Abe Lincoln closed 300 newspapers. Woodrow Wilson signed the Espionage Act of 1917 that made it illegal to quote, utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States. That would put most of us here behind bars for just a tweet. <laughs> and wouldn't some people be happy to see that? <laughs> Richard Nixon had journalists on his enemies list, including my eminent old colleague and friend, Dan Shore. President Obama blew the cobwebs off of Wilson's legislation to prosecute more government whistleblowers than all previous presidents combined. So as we confront the jobs we have to do in this era, let's remember that journalists have been on this ground before, and that's where we show what we're made of. Or for the copy editors in this room, that's where we show of what we're made. Look, this is a tough business. It should be. The stakes are real. We put our hands on people's lives, on events that can affect elections, reputations, life and death decisions, and events that are large, small, forgettable, and enduring. We're in journalism. It's not the academy, a yoga workshop, or a Zen monastery. Journalism is the profession of the front page, not Mary Poppins. It should and can be accomplished with civility, accuracy, and decency. The journalism is also rough and tumble. It's a contact sport, not a Montessori kindergarten. Our rumpled forebears in this business were among the deplorables of their times, swaggering, obnoxious, sweaty, and rowdy. But they created modern reporting that opened news to the public, independent of party, lobby, or faction. They told stories about murders, riots, wars, crimes, bribes, revolutions, nonsense, and insanities because it's all part of our human story and citizens of a democracy have the right to know and can be better citizens if they do. Journalists are not descended from timorous tribes of people who cringe at criticism or shudder at second guessing from a president, politicians, or even our own public. When there is carping, kvetching, and verbal assault from high places, we should keep in mind the example of Walter Payton, the great Chicago Bears running back. Just take the hits and keep on going. Thank you. <laughs>